Hi everyone and welcome to this Copernicus Marine Service Training for Ocean Colour. My name is Silvia Pardo. I'm on Earth Observation at Plymouth Marine Laboratory in the UK and I'm here uh, today to help you explore some of the ocean colour products you can access through the Copernicus Marine Service. During this workshop we will use uh, Copernicus data to visualise maps and to build time series for ocean colour uh, variables such as chlorophyll, concentration, remote sensing reflectances or turbidity, with a focus on those available for the North Atlantic Ocean. Uh, first, a few notes about the working environment. We are going to use this uh, Jupyter Notebook platform, which is an open source web application that allows you to create uh, and share documents containing images, text, uh, but most importantly, code. Uh, that you can run in real time and the platform supports a variety of programming languages and today we are going to use uh, Python which is as you know one of the most popular scripting languages available. Uh, you will find two uh, types of boxes uh, or cells in the Jupyter Notebook. Uh, you have the text and then you have um, going down the code and you can tell them uh, apart because the code uh, cells are numbered as you can see in there. Uh, to run the code, you only have to click on the play button over here. Uh, this uh, button uh, will stop uh, the execution of the code. And you can also use uh, a shortcut, a keyboard shortcut, uh, press and shift and enter will run one of the cells as well. So the objective of this training is to understand how to use Ocean Color to study different ocean processes. Uh, in general, we can talk about uh, two components in the global ocean. Uh, the first one is the biological component. So you have here uh, the chlorophyll uh, variables. And we can detect chlorophyll from space using ocean color sensors. And we can use chlorophyll concentration as a proxy of, of phytoplankton. And from chlorophyll, we can also derive other variables as primary production and uh, phytoplankton size classes. And second, we have the geochemical components of the ocean, and we can usually catalog this as uh, the optical uh, products. Uh, and you can find them on, the, on their, uh, that name on the uh, CMEMS catalog. And here we have variables such as remote sensing reflectances, um, diffuse attenuation, uh, turbidity, and so on. And these provide information on other water uh, components, such as suspended sediments, for example. For both of these uh, categories, we rely on the same ocean color technique of measuring the solar radiation that is backscattered by the surface of the ocean after it interacts with these constituents. And um, we had um, discussed this technique a little bit in the, in the presentation, so during the first round of, of this workshop. And here we have a fantastic example, for example, of what ocean color uh, is um, capable of detecting in this image acquired on the 22nd of May 2010 by MODIS, which is one of the uh, many ocean color sensors available at the moment. And uh, here the light is being reflected not only by the organic matter, so you can see the vegetation on land, but also the phytoplankton blooming in the sea. Uh, but uh, the light is also reflected by the atmosphere and by, uh, for example, in here, we have the, um, um, the Bristol, Bristol Bay. So you can see that the light is being reflected by uh, the inorganic constituents of, of the water. Um, we have three exercises uh, prepared for you. Uh, uh, so three parts in total, three videos and three uh, Jupyter notebooks that go with the with the videos. For, uh, parts one and two will focus on the biological component, and part three uh, will focus on the optical um, data set. And we will use this first part uh, to familiarize ourselves with the ocean color data, looking at the data structure and how to open files, how to access the uh, data, how to extract it, how to plot it. And then in part two and three, we will uh, use the data to study some interesting events. 
uh, such as a phytoplankton bloom in May 2018, or you will see the phytoplankton seasonal cycle in the Celtic Sea during 2019, and we will uh, study the sediment dynamics in the northwest uh, shelf seas. So, all uh, the data we're going to use um, uh, for these exercises are the Atlantic reprocessed chlorophyll data sets at level 3 and 4, as you can see in here, and also the global optical data set at level 3. Uh, for all of them, we will use the reprocessed version of the data, as opposed to near real time. Uh, so, uh, you can tell which version we are using because the reprocessed data set is, is labeled as rep. Uh, so this means that the data has been collected using uh, the state-of-the-art uh, processing uh, well, sensors and processing change, and it has been processed using the best possible ancillary, and all the different uh, available also in color sensors have been aggregated to provide maximum coverage. Um, it's important to have in mind that the ocean color products are generated from satellite observations only, not model or in situ data. Uh, and then you can basically, uh, that means that we have to be very careful about the region we are studying. So we are using uh, regional algorithms because the differences have different bio-optical properties, as we discussed during the presentation. And you can learn more about the uh, um, local regional algorithms by clicking in these links over here that will uh, get you to the uh, Copernicus Marine catalog and the documentation associated with the data we're going to use for this exercise. Okay, so let's get started with the uh, programming bit. So the first block of code that we're gonna um, see in here is to set up the environment. So an environment is a, is a namespace with keywords that uh, you can then use for the down in the code to call different libraries in different um, modules. Um, so these are the different libraries that we are gonna call. Uh, so first we have X-Array, which is uh, one of the most important ones that we'll, we will use to uh, open NetCDFs and to load the information inside those NetCDFs. NetCDF is the file, um, the file format that uh, the CMEMS catalog is organized in. Then we have matplotlib for data plotting. We have cartopy, uh, which is uh, another way of, of plotting for data that's geolocalized. So basically for uh, map uh, manipulation, map creation. Then we have NumPy, which is one of the most useful Python modules. We will use it for array manipulation, but it has all kinds of functions. Uh, date time for date uh, and time variable definition and operations. For example, if you have a date and you want to add uh, two months to that date, and this, this kind of uh, object or modules or functions will allow you to do that. We have OS or uh, for the uh, operating system um, dependent uh, functionality, such as uh, opening files, um, deleting files, uh, change in directories, path manipulation. And finally, we have a string for a string manipulation. Um, as you can see, we use the hash uh, symbol uh, to add comments to the code. So it's usually a good practice that you uh, comment your code uh, so you don't forget what you, what you did, uh, especially if you want to share your code um, uh, with other people. So we run this, and uh, by running this using the play uh, button, uh, all these libraries are loaded and available for us. And once the uh, environment has been set up, uh, we can start looking at the actual data. So first we will do the basics. Uh, that's uh, defining the names of the files that we're going to use and where they can be found. So to do this, we will create uh, this variable over here called root there and we will assign it to the current working directory so this is uh, how we will define the path to the data and um, files we will normally be archived on a directory in your computer but for this workshop you can assume the data has uh, already been uploaded uh, up here so you can uh, download some data during the the course of this exercise and put it on your uh, local uh, hard drive or your, your computer. And but then you will be have to be very careful and you will have to change this path to point to that. Um, then uh, another thing that we are probably seeing here for the first time is the use of the print function. 
Uh, so this is a syntax and basically you put the name of the variable uh, inside and uh, it will appear as a text in the screen. So for example, here we are printing the root directory and this is the output of, of, that, of that command. And you might also note some, uh, notice some differences between my output in here and your output. So when we print this final pads, um, this is due to differences in operating systems. So uh, we use this slash to join subdirectories sub to form a path string in Windows. But if you're running on Unix, then you have, will have a backslash. So don't be alarmed by that. Uh, so the output in here can look different for you than it's, it's looking for me. So in the following box, we will actually define two variables with the file names. Uh, the file names follow uh, the Copernicus Marine Service naming convention for ocean color data. So I will point you to the uh, product use manual you can access in here. Uh, if you want to know more about uh, the naming naming convention, but in general you have a, a string that identifies the date, then you have a, a, an identifier that tells you that's ocean color data. This is the production unit, so this Plymouth Marine Laboratory in this case, level of, of the data, so that's we are going to use both level four and level three. Uh, the name of the uh, data set, so in this case is chlorophyll, the name of the regional algorithm, in this case OC5CI. Multi uh, means that we have used, as I mentioned before, uh, all the sensors available uh, on this particular date or this period of time. You have the resolution, uh, the area, so ATL stands uh, for North Atlantic, and then you have uh, an identifier, three letter identifier um, that tells you if the data you're using is near real time or reprocess. Um, so, as I said, the data is in NetCDF uh, format, uh, which is a self describing machine independent data format that is frequently used uh, to share scientific data. Um, we then use these uh, variables, for example, and here we use the monthly uh, variable, so the, the variable for the monthly uh, data file and the data there that we defined it above, and we use this join function to build the final path to this file. Basically here we are printing it, so this is the path to this netcdf. So once we have defined where files are and the file names, then we can start uh, loading the files. So I uh, will scroll down a little bit and we can start accessing the data inside them. So for all this, we will use the X-Array module that we uh, imported at the beginning. So that's over there. And we will load the file to create a new data set using uh, the open data set function within X-Array. Um, so uh, there's uh, lots of options to use open data set and you can uh, check them uh, if, you, if you basically uh, look for the function online but in here we are just passing the path that we just printed in, in the box above. Um, one thing to take into account uh, is that the open data set function opens the file with read-only access so you can do whatever you want with the variables that you load here but the original file will, will never be changed. So we can now explore what's inside the level four uh, monthly file. <coughs> so to do this, we just use a print over the CCI chlorophyll level four monthly variable, which I have just defined. As you can see, the data is um, organized in four categories. So you, we have the dimensions, the coordinates, the data variables, and the attributes. The dimensions uh, represent the physical dimensions of the data, so like, uh, things like time, latitude, longitude, depth, even. On the data variables, uh, you have each uh, one variable, and each variable represents a set of values of the, same, of, of the same type. So, for example, we have the chlorophyll value in here, or the uh, chlorophyll count, or the chlorophyll error. Uh, coordinates are special variables, so these are variables that are associated with dimensions. So you have a uh, latitude dimension when you have the equivalent latitude variable. And finally, you have attributes that provide useful information, uh, such as the source of the data, version numbers, resolution, Siemens production unit, um, even uh, links to the documentation that you can you can use. Um, we can uh, see one, uh, each one of these in detail by accessing the different fields within the um, 
uh, CCI chlorophyll level 4 monthly viable. Um, so we have four fields within the dataset, again, dimensions, coordinates, variables, and attributes. And we pretty much get the same number of detail, but it's better formatted in this way. Um, so, for example, if we print the coordinates in here, it gives us a, a good preview of the actual values inside the array. So that you have uh, the values inside the latitude array, for example. And so you can see the um, products are created uh, codestantly in latitude and longitude. So that means that the distance uh, between pixels in degrees is, is a constant. And this might not always be the case for all the products. So you keep in mind or uh, always have a really good look at what you're uh, using using the print uh, function. Then we have the variables over here, uh, which are organized in a uh, dictionary. So that's a data structure that defines a list of pairs in no particular order, and each one of the pairs has a key and a value. Uh, and you can see uh, the um, dictionary in here, because uh, in Python they are defined by this curly uh, brackets. And then you have the key, in this case, for example, the latitude, and then um, um, a colon, and then you have the actual value, and so on. Um, the values can be of uh, the, of the data can be uh, of any type basically, and they can repeat. But the keys have to be all all of the same type and through the dictionary. It must be unique. Uh, if we scroll down, then we can print the attributes, uh, which provide a lot of information. So, for example, we have the quality index. Uh, so we have three levels of quality, and zero is the highest quality. Then we have the product level, um, the uh, name of the um, parameter, uh, the citation you need to use uh, when you are uh, using this data for one of uh, for your own studies. Uh, the NetCDF versions and NetCDF format has different versions. Uh, when it was created, for example, um, a little bit of a description about the algorithm, the resolution. Then you have the history, which is um, quite uh, useful because in this particular case, the monthly file has been um, built by aggregating uh, a lot of data, so one file per day. And then you have basically uh, in the metadata and the attributes, you have the list of files that were aggregated, which is very, very useful in general. So we've seen how the file is organized and we have the uh, learned the meaning of some of the different parts inside the file. And they are roughly the same for all the ocean color products. So let's have a look now at the, the individual variables. So in here, we are extracting the different variables for the uh, monthly data set, and we are assigning them to name uh, Python uh, variables. And this will save us time and space in the code below because we won't have to repeat the whole uh, call to the variable, but we will use this alias, for example, uh, to uh, signify to access the monthly chlorophyll uh, variable. And you can also see the differences between accessing the variables. So this is this part in here. Uh, and accessing the latitude, um, which is an element of the variable dictionary. Uh, we access it here, but we will access the fill variable uh, using a dot rather than the square brackets. By printing the content of the variables, we can find relevant information about them. So it's quite uh, similar to what we did uh, with uh, above, but with just one a single variable. Uh, and again, a better format because we are not seeing all the information at the same time. So we run this print command and we get the metadata for the chlorophyll variable. So the first line of the metadata uh, tells us that the uh, variable has three dimensions, time, latitude, and longitude. So in other words, the chlorophyll is going to be a three-dimensional array. And when we extract the data for the below, we will use three indexes to, to will represent time, latitude, and longitude uh, dimensions, respectively. Um, the metadata above, above describes the uh, chlorophyll as the mass concentration of chlorophyll in seawater in units of milligram per cubic meter. Uh, the valid min and valid max, which are in here, come in handy. Uh, if you want to know the ranges that the chlorophyll algorithm can resolve, 
And then finally you have the cell methods over here, the attribute that tells us that each value of the monthly composite is the mean of the, all the daily values that we've considered for that, for that month. In the same way, we can print uh, the uh, monthly latitude and monthly longitude variables. As we say, so in the uh, length of the latitude and um, longitude um, in here and in here, they are one dimensional arrays. So uh, they define the shape of the multi dimensional array. So if we go back to the chlorophyll, um, the width of the chlorophyll in here is uh, sorry no this is the width um, uh, 5664 which matches the length of the uh, longitude variable and similarly the height of the uh, chlorophyll variable this this number matches the length of the latitude um, uh, coordinate and the depth in here is always one because ocean color um, um, sorry, the depth of the of the chlorophyll bar, uh, variable is one because we are looking at just one composite. Uh, you can, might have another uh, dimension, which is the depth uh, in other products, uh, but that's not the case for ocean color because we only see the surface of the of the ocean. And scrolling down, last but not least, we have the monthly uh, time variable, which is a one-dimensional array with a single time uh, interval element. Basically, this this range in here, describing the period of time uh, covered by uh, of monthly composites. So, for basically, from the first of June 2017 to uh, the 30th of June 2017. Um, we might re you might remember that we have defined at the beginning uh, another data set called CCI Chlorophyll Level 3 Daily using the daily file name as an input. So we can use uh, the same command to investigate the daily variables, printing the latitude, the longitude, and, uh, and the time as we did, uh, and also the chlorophyll. So this basically is a small exercise for you. Um, to use the same uh, functions that we use on the monthly data set on the daily data set and look at the differences between uh, the two of them. So I suggest that you pause the video, you take a little break here and compare the output of, the, of this print instructions. Um, once you have done that, uh, we can continue to the final section, section of this first exercise and learn how to visualize chlorophyll data that we have loaded and extracted in the steps above. So the most straightforward to visualize a data array is to use the image show or um, M show for short function, which is uh, within the uh, pyplot library we imported at the beginning. And this returns uh, a matplotlib image access image, as you can see in here. As we discovered during the data exploration above, chlorophyll is a, a three-dimensional array with the three dimensions representing time, latitude, and longitude in that order. And when the variables are stored in an array, individual values can be selected by using indexing. So we need one index per dimension. So that's three indexes uh, for a 3D variable. Uh, why is this important? So basically to, to uh, be able to use the m show function uh, over the daily chlorophyll variable, we need to reduce the three-dimensional chlorophyll data set to a two-dimensional array. And this is done easily just by ignoring the time dimension because we know that it's just one file for one day. So the time dimension uh, length is one. Um, and the time then it doesn't really give us much information anyway. Um, so here, in here, we are selecting the first and only item along the time dimension by specifying the index. So that's the index for the uh, first dimension. Note that Python uses uh, serial indexing. So that means that the index number starts at zero, not at one, as, as one might think. And by doing this operation in here, this operation is called slicing. And we will come back to it later. But if you're curious, you can print uh, the um, slice array part and see basically this part in here and see how the shape of the array uh, is different from the shape of the array of the whole variable. 
Um, so we've printed this map in here. So this might be the, the quickest way, but it's not really the most informative way to visualize the data. So to start with, uh, all the data is just visualizing one color, one solid uh, block of color. It's tricky to, to distinguish the, the land from the clouds, for example, even if you're familiar with the uh, geography of the, of the region. And even worse, uh, we have the X and Y axis, and they are formatted using the indexes of, of the array instead of the latitude and the longitude coordinates. So thankfully, the uh, PyPlot library can be used together to, with Cartopy. Uh, car to be my map creating uh, creation tools in a more or less effortless way to create a much more nice service relation of the data. So first we will learn how to create uh, an empty map and then we will learn how to populate it with uh, chlorophyll data. So we first use a plot figure to create a new figure. We will use plot access uh, uh, to add access to the uh, current figure and make them the current access. Um, the most important part of this is uh, that uh, by plot access function uh, is calling uh, um, projection. So that's defining the projection is probably the most important decision you have to make before plotting um, uh, geolocated data. Uh, so as you know, a uh, map projection is a way to transform the globe, so that's the surface of a sphere, into a plane. So in other words, a flat map. So to do this, we need a systematic way to translate, transform the latitudes and longitudes of the locations on the surface of, of the globe into locations on the plane, on the map. And there are infinite ways to do this, uh, and none of them are totally correct, but some of them are more useful than others for different applications. So in this particular case, we use this uh, projection, uh, defined it, uh, uh, in the car to be CRS module that we imported at the beginning to define the projection. And this one is great to visualize the African continent, for example, uh, but it kind of flattens the map around the pole. So depending on what your region of interest is, you might want to use this one or not. <clears throat> so one, we have defined the axis of the figure, we can define things such as coastlines, for example, using the coastline method of the axis object. In the same way, we can define a map in several other projections. So uh, this one, for example, models the Earth uh, to a perfect 2 to 1 ellipse. So uh, then we have the azimuthal uh, equidistant, for example, which is what we call a polar projection, which shows all the uh, meridians uh, as straight lines and all the distance from the pole are represented correctly. So if this is your area of interest, this is a good projection for it. If you're uh, instead interested in, say, North Europe, probably not. And I have uh, provided a list of, uh, where is it? Ah, over here. Uh, a link uh, to uh, different uh, Matplotlib uh, packages, but also a link to all the projections available within the car to be uh, uh, module. So it will be probably a good idea to, uh, for you to click in here and go familiarize yourself with the different projections and choose one for your exercises. Um, okay, so now we know how to set up an empty map and we can uh, populate it using chlorophyll data. So the following uh, code box is really long in comparison with the previous boxes, but do not panic. So the steps all follow naturally from each other. So first we will uh, do what we already did. We will define, a set, uh, we will set up an empty map and then we will um, uh, initialize a, a figure with a certain uh, dimension and resolution. So that's what this is doing. So that is the dimensions and that's the resolution. Then we will create a, an empty map with the projection defined above. Uh, and we will define the axis and using those uh, newly defined axis, we will add some coastlines. And now we will do the actual plotting using the p color mass function within the pyplot uh, module. 
and this will create a pseudo color map which uh, where each uh, data point is drawn as a cell so it's not just a point it's an actual square uh, it's a pixel uh, region on the plot and it will be colored according to the data value so the uh, plot color mess function needs three arrays as an input so the first two those two have to be uh, two-dimensional arrays uh, defining the rectangular grid uh, that defines the geolocation of your of your data. Uh, so this means, as, as you remember, uh, our uh, daily lo longitude and latitude variables were one-dimensional. So this means that we need to convert them to two-dimensional uh, variables or arrays. And we do this using this. Uh, functioning here, so that's the numpy mess grid uh, function that converts these two uh, variables to one uh, two-dimensional arrays. Um, so we have all the two variables, and then we have the third variable, which is the chlorophyll, which is the one that we uh, want to represent. We will come back uh, to that one later. Uh, we have uh, another argument which is important, which is the C map, uh, is the color map instance, so register color map name. So that's the bit that tells the map um, or the ma that maps the correspondence between values or and colors. And we will see different color maps for the down. We will use a v min and v max uh, to specify the value range that the color map is going to cover. So if we don't include this argument, um, the suit, whatever suitable minimum and maximum uh, values from the variable array will be selected by, automatically by, by Python. So uh, coming back to the variable, uh, bear in mind that we have chosen to plot the chlorophyll values in logarithmic space. And uh, there are two reasons for this. First, uh, chlorophyll values are um, typically ranged across several orders of magnitude. And secondly, uh, the globally in the ocean, chlorophyll is known to be log normal. So in other words, the logarithmic values of global chlorophyll follow a normal distribution. So this might not be the case or might not be useful for other variables. So keep that in mind when you compare how we are plotting in here with uh, other uh, Jupyter notebooks. And basically with this instruction in here, we are mostly uh, done. Um, uh, and the next few lines is basically just formatting. Uh, we use uh, the access, the grid line um, attribute or stuff function uh, within the access to define the grid lines. So, and tell our plotter uh, what the format, the grid lines we want them to be. So, uh, we will say that the labels will be drawn on the four sides of the figure, and that's uh, how it's done by default. We can override this behavior. Uh, using these lines, for example, uh, we are making the top and the right hand labels disappear. Um, the style of the labels can be configured, as you, you can see here, you can define things as the color and the size of the font. Um, the next two uh, lines define the geographical extent of the map by specifying uh, maximum and minimum values for the x and y axis. And finally, we can add a color bar that shows the correspondence between the colors and the values, and this facilitates the interpretation of the data. So um, the color bar function has attributes that define um, what, where, where is the uh, data we are referring to. So the, the plot we are referring to is plot that we just defined over there. The orientation of the color bar how big it is, how separated it is from the plot, and we can choose where the different ticks for the different numbers uh, will be. Uh, then we will label uh, the different ticks. So you can have, uh, by default, the labels will be the numbers that you use to define your ticks, but you can label them whatever you, you want. And finally, we will have a, a big label saying what the color bar or is, is um, showing. In this case, it's the chlorophyll concentration in milligrams per cubic meter. And finally, we can include a plot title. Uh, this instruction here will show the plot and this instruction here will save the plot 
and the results directory and it will call it um, uh, so it will generate uh, an image with this name basically so you can find the image in here in the results directory and this is basically the final map which is pretty nice and we can probably do the same uh, way the same thing for the monthly data set so the only difference is that the variables we are going to use are monthly and probably you will want to uh, define the title uh, instead of saying that is um, the chlorophyll concentration for the 15th of June you will say that is for the whole month of June so but all the structures are exactly the same so I won't go through them through them um, but uh, then in here I, I suggest you have a play with the code as we suggest in this in this uh, little exercise prompt in here and you can think about how you can change the color of the continents for example in here the continents are in white maybe you can plot them in a different color uh, label the latitude and longitude axis so include a, a big label in here saying latitude and big label in here saying longitude for example um, playing with the axis limits and see what happens so for example if uh, in here we are uh, interested in, in a small region see try to define this box when you use the axis set x limit and set y limit functions over here instead of just the maximum and the minimum variable uh, variable values for the monthly latitude and latitude and longitude and latitude in this case so that's a small exercise uh, that you can you can do and to finish this section we will uh, see that the slicing technique that I mentioned above in more detail so we will use the slicing to zoom uh, on a box around the, the British Isles using the monthly composite as the input so we first define this uh, geographic box about the British Isles and here and the subsequent um, functions uh, sorry calls uh, we use the numpy where function so that's the numpy where function to identify which array indexes are inside the coordinate box that we have just defined and which one of them are this um, outside and this will uh, return uh, two-dimensional arrays of latitude and longitude <coughs> indexes that fulfill these logical conditions so those are the logical conditions that we are imposing um, so the original latitude and longitude coordinates were one dimensional in here then we obtain a two dimensional index variable and then we have to convert them back to one dimensional so that's exactly what we do in here using the numpy squeeze uh, variable so at the end we have one dimensional latitude subset indexes and one dimensional longitude subset indexes if you are interested in you know in a little bit more about the shapes you can always use the print function and the numpy shape function and give it as an argument one of these uh, several arrays that we have, have just defined it and finally we start the zooming data from the monthly chlorophyll variable and also the latitude and longitude uh, by replacing the uh, columns we have so if you remember when we uh, plotted or accessed the variable we had a zero comma uh, colon comma colon and we replace those columns by the indexes that we have just defined so that gives you um, that's exactly the, how a slicing works you're selecting a small slice of the whole array um, by using this syntax um, so if you're interested I've uh, explain the inner workings of his license uh, in terms of start and end indexes in great detail in here but this is not essential for the rest of the uh, exercise so the important thing is that we have defined our zoom data array uh, in here uh, so that's the zoom in data array and the corresponding zoom in latitude and longitude and we will use those uh, in a similar plotting um, sequence as we saw in there to just zoom in uh, to the chlorophyll concentration around the British Isles for the a month of June 2017 so again this plotting sequence is exactly the same as we saw above 
the only difference is that now we are using the zoom in longitude uh, latitude and the um, zoom chlorophyll array and we you will also notice that I have used a, a um, slightly different color map uh, so uh, that's called magma so that's a different way of visualizing the chlorophyll data and here's your final map of the chlorophyll concentration for the month of June just around the, the British Isles um, so this is the end of the first part. I really hope that you have enjoyed this practical session. It's a lot of information to take in, so please take your time. You have a, done a great job. So feel free to stay here a little longer, uh, play around with all the possible ways to visualize the data. Um, I've left you a little challenge in here as well, in case you're up for it. You can try to use all these tools to extract uh, uh, information, the variables, and create visualizations of a primary production data set. Uh, so I have basically um, hidden a, a, a primary production file for June 2017 here in the data folder. So you can look for it and repeat the, the exercise, including the generation of these maps for the primary production and see how the uh, dimensions and attributes are different from the chlorophyll variable, how the global data looks like, the uh, differences in units, for example, uh, is um, primary production a log normal variable, for example, so do you have to do the uh, log transformation before you plot it? So all those kind of questions, and you have questions about it, you can, you can ask me. Uh, and when you're ready to move on, I will see you in part two. Thank you. Thank you.